how the homophony that we've talked about before, the melody and accompaniment being the only two things that uh, are apparent there, there's nothing distracting you from anything, from the melody, I should say. The melody, the accompaniment, it's very clear tonally. We hear nice, clean four bar phrases. Um, there are no really twists and turns. Everything is nice and laid out for us. Let's have a listen. energy of the piece. So here we go. Revolution, 
some of that cloud gets pulled away from Vienna and moves towards Paris as well. And so this idea of rebelling against the authority figures uh, is very important to the Romantic composers. Okay? <clears throat> as I said before, the instruments and really everything, as we'll talk about in a minute, gets bigger in the Romantic period. Bigger is better for the Romantics. Um, and the instruments are one way in that in how that manifested itself. Um, thanks in part to the the uh, Industrial Revolution, we had a lot more uh, tools to help the instrument makers make instruments better. But there were a lot of technological advances for instruments and instrument makers um, that allowed the instruments ranges to be expanded, play lower and higher, sometimes by inventing completely new instruments. Um, for instance, I have up here the saxophone, because I'm a saxophone player, it was invented during this period, 1846. Um, but the, the actual instruments themselves, so the clarinet had been around since Mozart's time, but the, the advances in the technology allowed clarinets to be made really small. The E-flat clarinet to play extremely high registers. For the flute, we have the piccolo was invented here. We have the bass clarinet on the other end, the low end tuba, uh, euphonium, all of these instruments, the low, low end, the contrabassoon, were take the, the range of the, of the orchestra, excuse me, and just expands it, uh, giving the composers much greater depth of sound to play with. Uh, the instrument manufacturers also came up with nifty little ways of making it easier to play quickly. Before, the violins and string instruments could really outplay the wind instruments in terms of speed. Uh, the, there was a guy named Bohm who took that and completely re-envisioned how um, fingering systems for instruments that were keyed should be played. Um, so the flute, the clarinet, the uh, oboe all adopted these, this instrument, uh, or excuse me, this fingering technique that made everything much more fluid, much more easier to play quickly giving the composers ample opportunity to exploit that and write really difficult stuff for them. Um, the brass instruments also were uh, improved upon by adding valves. Before it was just a big tube and you uh, changed pitches by messing with your lips. And so they added valves to make it much easier for, for the, the performers to make those changes. Um, the strings, steel strings, were added to give a uh, more projecting sound, make it louder. We talked about range, we've talked about speed, now we're talking about volume. The piano, too, is, in my opinion, the king of the instruments in this time period, especially. Um, the piano, a lot, it was around before the Romantic period, uh, but it kind of as the piano forte, which we've talked about a little bit in terms of Mozart as that evolved from the harpsichord. Um, and that instrument was kind of a wimpy little thing. It was meant for very private performances, does not project very well. And so the, the instrument manufacturers made the instrument a lot bigger, but more grand, the grand piano, um, by using these steel reinforced um, beams that they could make the strings longer um, and tie them tighter without the thing collapsing on itself. Um, and so composers loved the piano at this time because it's basically an orchestra at your fingertips. Um, you can have these big expressive gestures um, just with one person playing them. So naturally that is a, an attractive thing for a composer. <clears throat> Outside of the actual physical instruments, the genres themselves kept getting expanded upon, made bigger. We talked a little bit in the classical period about the sonata form, uh, the scherzo form. We talked a little bit about rondo. Um, and so these forms are still around in this time period a lot. It's not even like they kind of get forgotten about. They, they get used a lot, but messed with. The composers would mess around with them. So Beethoven, for instance, would take the coda of a piece and just go nuts with it. Whereas Mozart or Haydn would write like a four bar coda, Beethoven writes these 50 measure um, codas just go on and on and on and on. And that's because he's trying to heighten this sense of um, 
drama, the, this unexpectedness that comes from the music that is so important to this uh, time period. Other composers just take the structure and just completely blow it out of proportion. Uh, whereas Symphony of Mozart would maybe last uh, 20 minutes or so. Uh, Symphony by the end of the Romantic period with Mahler or Bruckner will take two hours sometimes. So the, the scope of the pieces just completely get exploded. Occasionally, some of the, uh, the composers would just completely invent new genres. Um, one of them being the symphonic poem, I think probably the most important for the history of music. Uh, when Mozart would go to approach writing a piece, a symphony for instance, um, there's at least no evidence that we can find that he was thinking about anything other than music. He was thinking about this melody, this particular configuration of notes that forms a chord. How can I mess around with that and transform it and play with it? In the Romantic period, composers started going to sources outside of music, um, literature, nature. Uh, and the perhaps the most famous inventor of this, uh, which of course is debatable, but uh, Berlioz, for me, uh, writes the quintessential romantic piece in his Symphony Fantastique of 1830. And in the symphony, instead of thinking about um, melodies and harmony in a traditional way, how can I combine them, create these cool sounds? He thinks about himself and his own experiences. He's fallen in love with this woman. She does not love him back. He gets upset. Uh, and he writes this whole narrative where he takes some opium and passes out and dreams about his love as a witch dancing in a coven. It's crazy, but awesome. Um, and he publishes this narrative along with a piece of music. And the music paints this, um, this narrative uh, as it goes. And so it, that's where this term tone poem, tone painting, symphonic poem, they're all, they all kind of mean the same thing. Because they're trying to make a poem, a narrative, out of the music. Um, and that's really a new thing that has not really been done before. Um, some say Beethoven kind of dangled his feet in that uh, with the Sixth Symphony, but uh, no one really explored that in any depth until the Romantic period. Uh, other composers that picked that up was Richard Strauss later, um, and also uh, Franz Liszt that we just listened to. Um, another important genre that, is, that happens in the Romantic period is the song cycle. Songs have been around for as long as anything. But uh, as the composers shifted to extra musical inspirations, song particularly became important for them uh, because of the words. It's basically the same thing that uh, Berlioz did. He focused the music on the words, only he had, this is actually taking the words and putting them in the music, setting them to music. That becomes very, very important for the composers. Gustav Mahler, Hugo Wolf are some important names that we'll talk about later in terms of song cycle. And last, music drama. Music drama was invented by uh, Wagner, and the actual, the cartoon at the beginning was a parody of Wagner, uh, one of his uh, ring cycle operas that we'll talk a little bit about. Um, and what a music drama is, is basically an opera on steroids. It's, it's an opera that it's not just about the story and the music, which is what opera had been before. It's a way to tell a play, but sing it. Um, and what a music drama was, at least in Wagner's idea of it, is it's not just the story. It's about the actual poetry of the words themselves. It's not just about the characters, it's about the choreography, and about the set design, and about the, uh, the music itself, of course, is very important. And Wagner would create these hugely long, again, expanded operas that he didn't think the term opera was good enough for him, so he called them music dramas. Um, and then, so let's just take a look at, I've already thrown some composer names at you, but here are some uh, of the other names that we'll be talking about in this period. Um, basically, this is a big period for music. Uh, if you've heard of a classical composer, chances are they're, they're on this list here unless they're Mozart or Haydn, um, 
or Bach, I guess, gotta throw Bach in there. But this is kind of, if you haven't heard of those three, and you have heard of someone, it's probably on this list. This is just a very, very important time, very popular time. These composers continue to get played all the way up until today, and they will continue to get played as long as people are still playing music. So um, I just have a small assignment for you this week. Um, if you go on Blackboard, there's a little music clip there for you to listen to. I just have a set of five questions that goes with it. If you just answer, I'm looking for one or two sentences only, I don't want an essay, just nice, quick, succinct answers and post them on, on the blackboard.